application webinar for Fair Chance. The application for the partnership is due next Friday, but you can join us. And you'll have an opportunity today, the highlight of this presentation will be an opportunity to hear from one of our capacity building specialists and one of our partners about the um, partnership experience, so you'll know what to expect. First, I want to make some introductions. So I'm Mona Sanders. I'm the Acting Director of um, Outreach and Network Services for Fair Chance. And I'm joined today by Anjali Nanpal. She is one of Fair Chance's long-serving capacity building specialists. And Susie Hirsch, who is the Executive Director of Chess Challenge in DC and was a partner in 2012. In 2012. And you'll be able to hear from both of them a little bit later on in the presentation. So I want to just quickly give you some background about Fair Chance and the partnership program. Fair Chance improves the lives of children in Washington, D.C.'s most underserved communities by selecting promising youth-serving nonprofits and providing them with a year or two, in some cases, of free comprehensive expertise in organizational management. Who we serve? We work with executive directors of promising youth-serving nonprofits. We provide them with customized capacity building assistance, again, for one year. In some cases, there's the opportunity to apply dependent on funding and performance in the first year for second year. And the way that we deliver this capacity building service is through one-on-one -on -one coaching. The goal of the engagement of the partnership year is to increase the knowledge, skills, and confidence of the executive director of the organization, but also to position the, the organization and move it toward growth and sustainability. The work that the capacity builders do with the organizations is focused in eight areas, or up, up to eight areas, and those include board development, fundraising, strategic planning, communications and outreach, leadership development, financial management and analysis, program evaluation and monitoring, and human resources. The organization is expected to make progress in at least four of those areas, and they are usually the focus is, is selected strategically depending on what the organization's needs at that current moment are. So we also, during the partnership year, um, supplement those services through um, uh, additional membership benefits that include being a part of our network of nonprofit organizations. Uh, that's a network of, of nonprofits that has been through the partnership program, and that includes some of the leading nonprofits in Washington, D.C., the most sort of well-known. Um, and um, there are, at this point, some 60-some-odd organizations in that network. Um, we provide a series of pro bono services to partners during the year, particularly in, at this moment in time, um, legal services that you can um, avail yourself of at any time. And we are looking at expanding the array of those services. We also have exclusive workshops for our members that focus on important areas of capacity building to help foster their continued growth and development. And we bring together the executive directors of our partner nonprofits for um, small breakfasts where they, if they're ED only breakfasts or lunches where they meet with our executive director and talk, can talk about issues of immediate concern in the context of peers and confidentiality. Um, um, so I want to talk with you quickly, um, folks ask, well, who's eligible for this partnership? Um, and I want to talk a little bit about that. We look at three things, three areas. One, the organization itself. We look at, at its mission and program. And we look also, now we are, we, the partnership is actually um, open to affiliates or chapters of national organizations under certain conditions. I'm going to talk about what those eligibility requirements are. So first of all, at base, the organization has to have um, current status as a 501c3 organization under the Internal Revenue Code. Um, it has to have a full-time executive director. That means 40 hours per week that that person works in that position. They can be paid or unpaid. But they also have to have a board of directors that has at least three members and a designated chairperson. We also look to make sure that they have committed or expecting, expected funding that's enough to support the organization and its programs for one year. So the funding doesn't have to be in hand, but they have to have a reasonable expectation that they will be receiving it. We also look to see whether the executive committee the executive director and the board chair are truly committed to meeting the requirements of the partnership, which are pretty rigorous, as, are, as defined in the partnership um, agreement. And we'll talk about a little bit about those here, um, and there'll be opportunities for you to ask questions to delve into more detail about those at the end of the presentation. 
So the eligible organizations have to have a mission that, or at least one program that addresses a specific and demonstrable need of children and youth. And again, we define that as, as those who are between ages 0 and 24 who are living in poverty um, in Washington, D.C. And the, the organization or the program has to have been in operation for at least a year. And it also has to have an enrollment that's made up of at least 50% D.C. residents who either live in neighborhoods that are high poverty neighborhoods, so those where at least 30% of residents are at or below the federal poverty level. And again, we use, um, we, we use that the definition of the Federal Census Bureau, but if you have an alternative definition that you use you could, that you believe is legitimate, we would be open to looking at that. So it's either that they live in those neighborhoods or they have family incomes that are at or below the federal poverty level, or they're eligible for free or reduced price lunch, or they attend high poverty schools or any of the um, 40 schools in need that are designated in need of improvement by DCPS. So you have to be able to demonstrate that the, the children and youth you serve fit into one of those categories. So increasingly in the last few years, we've had um, questions from organizations that are actually local chapters or affiliates of national organizations. And we've thought a lot about what, what would make them eligible to apply. And, and these are the guidelines for those organizations. <coughs> Excuse me. They have to be locally focused and embedded in the communities where they work. And they have to have the flexibility to tailor their programs to meet the needs of the children and youth in those communities. They also have to have locally focused boards that are responsible for supporting the work in DC specifically. And they need to be able to identify clearly at least four areas where capacity building support would really improve their ability to serve the children that they're working with currently. Um, they also need to have sufficient staff and resources to deliver their DC programs. So really, you know, ready to be either ready to go or, or, or fully um, resourced and running. So just a quick um, you know, recap to make very clear about what the partnership is. It is a year-long opportunity to work with a capacity building specialist one-on-one -on, -one on a weekly basis. Um, I didn't say earlier, it's eight hours a week of commitment that we're looking for. It's not, it's not an in-person commitment. There's a weekly meeting with your capacity building specialist, but there is homework and there is preparation that needs to be done for that meeting. But it's not a grant, so there's no, fun, there's no money um, involved. And, um, but the value of this, this opportunity is at least $50,000. Um, so it's important to think to understand that. Um, it is also not an extra staff person that you can just delegate work to. And it's not a traditional consulting relationship in the sense that we're not going to come in and do a strategic plan for you. We're not going to deliver a product and then leave. The idea is to make a sustained investment in your growth and sustainability to stay with you for one year and possibly even two to make sure that that sticks. Um, so um, the other piece I think that, that Susie um, will probably speak to pretty eloquently is um, that it is a great opportunity for an ED to have a thought partner that can really help them think strategically about where they want to take the organization next. Um, and another important benefit of being part of this partnership is that it embeds you in this vibrant network of nonprofits across Washington, D.C. that are working with children and youth, many of whom now collaborate informally or formally, um, share resources, and are a um, network of peers that help um, each other be successful in their work. Um, they are joined, we didn't mention earlier um, either that they are joined or they're facilitated in their collaboration by membership in an online forum that's restricted only to those nonprofit leaders. Um, and that's a place where a lot of inf information sharing and resource sharing occurs. So um, I want to see at, at this stage, does anybody have questions? And if you do have questions and you're not on a microphone, um, Please type them in, and we will we'll wait a minute to sort of see what comes in, and then we'll we'll, we'll share those with everybody and um, and do our best to answer your questions. Maybe just type in the chat that you don't have questions, and then we can move on. Okay, I'm going to move on. I think we don't have any questions. Okay. So I'm going to give you a quick overview before I introduce our guests. I'm going to give you a quick overview of the process. 
um, the way the partnership um, works. So there's an application and selection process, which is underway right now. So the applications will be due next week. Um, and after we receive them, we do a review to check in to make sure that they're complete. And if you, are, if you meet the eligibility requirements, uh, we will set up an interview to meet with you and have a more extensive conversation about your application and your organization. There's a final very rigorous selection process that occurs where our team comes together to review the results of those interviews and the applications. We make the announcements at um, the end of April, the beginning of May, and the partnership actually begins on May 1st. And there's a very intensive experience that you have with your capacity builder where you get to know each other. And you complete um, a thorough assessment of the organization working together. Um, so the capacity builder really understands where your um, opportunities are, where your pain points are, and where there are areas for growth. That results in a work plan that then guides your first year partnership. And there's specific goals around that partnership that you work toward with your capacity builder weekly um, over the course of the year. And that year culminates in a wonderful graduation ceremony, which hopefully Susie will talk about a little bit. That brings together all of our partners. It brings together funders and other stakeholders. And they get to tell their stories. And it's a big celebration of their accomplishments. It's something we really um, value and I think our partners very much enjoy. Um, if organizations want to continue the work, and they have done great work the first year, and there's um, strategic opportunities for them for growth. Um, we will, if funding is available, um, there is the opportunity to apply for a second year partnership. That's a less intensive process. It's fewer hours per week, and it's uh, more strategically focused in fewer areas. The capacity builder will continue working with the, with the executive director over the course of that year. So, and then, um, of course, embedded in, that's all embedded in the um, opportunities that we provide through our network and through our network services to receive additional assistance and um, work with your peers and learn from your peers. Um, and then after the partnership is over, you remain embedded in that network at the benefit of having gone through the partnership and continue to avail yourself of those resources. So without further ado, I'm going to um, introduce um, our two guests. Um, our first guest is Anjali Nagpal. She has been with Fair Chance for five years as a capacity building specialist. She's one of our most seasoned capacity builders. And she brings to this experience um, seven years of experience as the executive director of the Asian Pacific Islander Domestic Violence Resource Project. Um, she helped, as executive director of that organization, she helped transition the organization from an all-volunteer-based emerging nonprofit to an established staff-based community resource. She is a past recipient of the Asian Pacific American Bar Association Educational Fund's Public Service Award and the DC Mayor's Outstanding Community Service Award. She has a JD from George, George Washington University Law School and a BA in Religious Studies from the University of Virginia. So I'm going to ask Anjali some questions about her experience and what she does as a capacity builder. She's engaged in a partnership. So Anjali, could you talk to us a little bit about the sequence of the partnership? you're going to find to your partner, um, how you decide what you're going to work on together, and what that looks like, that process looks like. Sure. Um, well, hello, everyone. Um, it, following up on what Mona already shared in terms of what the, the process looks like and um, the wheel, I think it was the slide that was a couple before this that talked about the, sorry, yeah, we're just trying to get there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> once you're through application and selection, um, you get assigned a capacity building specialist, and um, that is your capacity building specialist for the entire year. Um, and your capacity building specialist really works with the organization um, to accomplish the goals that we set out. And how we determine what those goals are is listed here as number two in the assessment and work plan phase. So we spend about the first two months um, really delving into the organization and trying to get an understanding of what the organization has in place, what it needs, what's working, what's not working in each of our eight areas. Um, and at the end of the assessment, so sort of at the end of that two months, we produce an assessment report that details our findings and um, that we draft a work plan based upon those findings. And we share that work plan with the executive director in draft form because it really is a process where we want the feedback and input of what we're going to be doing for the next year is really driven by the executive director and their 
prioritizing and understanding um, of what the, the needs are and what makes the most sense. And we bring, as capacity builders, you know, we can bring to that discussion a sense of wh what needs to be worked on strategically. So, for example, you know, there might be certain things that we want to do in communications before we want to ramp up what we're doing in fundraising because we really want to be clear about our messaging through our fundraising. Um, so the, the capacity building specialist and the executive director work together to finalize that work plan and really determine where we need to start. And then every three months we check in and make sure that we're doing the work that we wanted to do, that what we laid out in the work plan is still relevant. Oftentimes within the partnership year, new things come up, new opportunities arise, new crises, whichever. Um, and so we want to be responsive um, to the, the needs as they change throughout the year too. So we check in on the work plan every three months to see our progress, but also to chart out what now is the real priority for the next three months. Um, and that's sort of how, how it starts and where it goes from there. And we write a work plan that covers all eight areas, but as Mona mentioned, our goal in the first year is really to focus on four of those areas in depth. Um, and that really depends on each organization and what their needs are. That's great. Thank you, Anjali. Can you talk a little bit about some of the capacities that you've helped organizations build? And could you describe it in terms of where they were when you found them? Um, you know, what the challenge or opportunity was that you, they had that was presenting and that you could work with them on, and what you actually helped them to do, and then what was possible for the organization as a result of the work you did? What did they do to build on that, or what did that enable them to do? Sure. Um, so, as Mo mentioned, I've been at Fair Chance for five years. Um, so in those five years, I've worked with 12 different nonprofits here in the city, which has just been a great experience um, for me and I hope for the executive directors and the organizations as well. Um, so I've done a lot of different things within each of our eight areas. Um, so I'm just going to focus on one example to sort of narrow that. Um, I worked with an organization that had a budget of about $350,000. Um, their budget process um, prior to our partnership consisted of the executive director looking at last year's budget, looking at the actuals from last year, and then making some adjustments to, adjustments to the numbers based on inflation and some sense of growth that the executive director anticipated in the next year. Um, a board committee would then look at the budget and it would be shared with the full board and approved with very little discussion. Um, in the partnership year, we devised a new budgeting process for the organization that focused on an annual strategic plan and engaged both the board and the staff. So we started the session with um, a sort of our budget planning process with a session with the staff, and we asked them to review the, the previous year in terms of what worked well, what changes they wanted to institute, what things they needed to do their job better, and what goals they wanted to set for the next year. And we didn't talk about money with them. We didn't start this as a, we're here to talk about the budget, but really it was more from a planning, a program, programmatic planning perspective. Um, and then when we did, after we did that, we looked at their feedback and took into consideration anything that would require money and that we would need to add into next year's budget or take out based upon what those goals were that they set. Um, and this process revealed things that the executive director had never thought about, um, which actually made a huge difference in the lives of the staff, but were small things in terms of the budget. For example, one of the things that the staff talked about was how they spent a lot of time having to collate things because they produced packets for their students, um, and they didn't have a printer that would collate. And they said, we could save hours, <laughs> and it would make our lives a lot happier if we just had a printer that would collate, um, which was a, a copier that would do that, and that was a, a cost that the organization could manage. Um, and really, the staff felt that they were being responded to, and that it, like I said, it made their lives a whole lot easier. We also changed how the executive director presented the budget to the board. Um, so we shared the programmatic and organizational goals for the year, and showed how the budget tied into those goals, um, as well as sharing the staff's analysis of the past year. And what that resulted in was that the board asked a lot more questions. Um, the numbers had more meaning to them. 
and they understood how the budget reflected plans for the future. And it actually, in the long term, created a, a more strategic and thoughtful organization um, because they started instituting these planning processes and became more goal-oriented, right? The board became more focused on what the goals were for the, for the year. Um, they were able to sort of direct other things to align with the goals. Um, and thinking about helping that the organization reach those goals, not just through the budget, but um, also in terms of how they did their executive director annual review and things like that. That's great. Um, and so, like looking back now, so what, what, where, where is that organization now? So their budget has grown incredibly. I I don't know exactly where it is, but it's it's well over five hundred thousand. Um, and and the executive director has actually formed a lot of different partnerships and, um, and has, has been able to focus on some advocacy work in terms of speaking more at, at budget council hearings and things like that to ensure that funding is, is being directed towards um, their area. That's great. Mm -hmm. um, thank you. Um, I'm wondering if you could um, also, in addition to this example, summarize some of the other successes your partners have had as a result of working with you sort of briefly, sort of, you know, specific service area that you worked in, um, and then what kinds of things that the organizations were able to do as a result that they hadn't been able to do before. Sure. A couple of quick examples. Okay. Because um, I could go through every single one. Oh, yeah. If you could have um, a great example for each one, I think that's important. No. <laughs> I think that would take up too much time. Um, but so I'll, I'll just talk about um, three of the areas. I'm going to focus on board development, fundraising, and program evaluation. Um, so in board development, I've worked with organiza organizations to transition boards from being a board of an all-volunteer organization to being a board of an organization with staff. Um, I've helped executive directors learn how to manage their boards better in order to improve their communications with their board members, um, to set mutual expectations so that the, the, the board is really clear about what they expect from, from the executive director, but more importantly, um, the executive director gets clarity around what they should and can expect from their board. Um, and then also enabling the board to really take ownership of the organization and moving towards a process where there's a pipeline of board leadership. Um, I've helped organizations revamp their board recruitment and orientation processes um, so that they've been able to get new folks on the board and set those new people up for success. Um, one of the things that we hear so often is, we need help finding new board members, and so I've done a lot in terms of the, the board recruitment, and there is no um, quick fix and that makes everything magic and work, but um, so you, we, it's an opportunity to really delve into different strategies around uh, what makes the most sense for that organization's board and what type of board they are looking to create um, or what board they already have. In fundraising, I've helped organizations strengthen their applications to get the most relevant information um, and tailor the way in which they communicate who they are and what they do to match a funder's priority areas. I've helped organizations improve their end-of-year appeal letters, um, set up annual fundraising plans so that they're thinking strategically about when they ask for money and scheduling events and other fundraisers to ensure that they won't have cash flow issues. Um, in program evaluation, I've helped organizations develop their theory of change and their logic models or refine them if they already have them. Um, so that they can really start using data to improve their programs if they don't already, um, and so that they can tell their stories with more clarity and focus. So those are just some of the things. That's great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I, I want to ask you a question I actually haven't asked you to prepare for, so I, if I put you on the spot, I, I, I apologize, and you can just pass. But I'm curious to know, what's the biggest success one of your partners has had as a result of the partnership with you? The biggest one. Oh. Um, I don't know. I feel yeah, that. <laughs> I did not prepare for this, so um, so I, ooh, that's a hard one. Um, think about it. We can come back to it. I, I yeah. So I, I'll just off the top of my head. I think um, one of the organizations I worked with early on had a co-executive director model, and um, and it was working well for them. And then very early in our partnership year, um, one of the executive directors, co-executive directors. Um, got offered a, an opportunity that they just couldn't let pass by. And, um, and it was really right for that person and also would help the organization some. But it meant switching their leadership model. 
Um, and, you know, having an executive director who was formerly a co-executive director now step up to be their, um, the only executive director. And that transition, I think, is challenging, um, but also um, we, we not only survived it, um, I think we thrived and were really able to position that leader um, to, to grow the organization in ways that I don't think any of us anticipated it would go. So, all right, thank you. Um, so my last question to you, Angeline, then I'm going to turn it over to Susie, is just tell, me, tell, tell us a little bit about what it's like to work with executive directors, what your relationships are like, and what do you enjoy most about them? Um, I think, as, as was mentioned earlier, you know, I'm, I see my role as being a thought partner, um, as being part of the support system. Having been an executive director myself, I understand um, and, and probably too quickly put myself in in, in their shoes and um, understand the demands on the time and the prioritization that needs to happen and um, the million different things that executive directors are responsible for. Um, so, so I see myself really as being someone that's part of their, that executive director support system and um, as an additional resource and really, really know that the ex executive directors that I work with have a tremendous amount of skills and capability and knowledge, and um, and I'm just there to help push them forward and help them reach their goals in the best way that um, that we can figure out. I think for me, um, it's really when I was an executive director, I had um, some some supports and people who were really able to help me figure out where I wanted to go and where I wanted to take my organization by just asking questions. Um, and so some of my role really does involve that leadership coaching piece um, that, that I think can, can really give an executive director the space that they need to, to achieve what they want. Great. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, so without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Susie Hirsch. I'm going to have some questions for Susie. And let me tell you a little bit about Susie. Um, Susie is the Executive Director of Chess Challenge. You see, you can see her here with, with Anjali at graduation, um, proud graduate after her first year. Um, so Susie has worked professionally in the field of fundraising for 23 years. Um, she began her development career as, in 1992 as a planned giving office, officer for a uh, major local nonprofit. And then from 2000 her, until her appointment as Executive Director of Chess Challenge in 2008, she was the president of her own company, the S. Hirsch Group. Um, which provided financial resource development consulting to nonprofits across the metro DC area. And in August 2007, Richard England, who is a local funder, approached her to assist him in the formation of a new nonprofit that he envisioned would provide an academic after-school chess program for underserved children in DC. For 10 months, um, Susie worked with other professionals to conduct due diligence, and then she established the legal and financial foundation for the organization, she hired staff, helped recruit the board of directors, and organized and initiated a fundraising campaign to get the organization started. Since its formation in 2008, Susie has led Chess Challenge to a place of prominence in DC's youth development community. She has a BA in Fine Arts and an MLS in Information Studies from Syracuse University and has taken numerous professional courses in plan giving. So, um, Susie, I, I'd love to, um, Susie's going to talk to us about what the partnership looks like from a partnership perspective. Um, and specifically, Susie, what I'd love to hear you talk about is what were the what was the, the goal, what were the sort of scope and goals of your partnership when you started? What were you all going to focus on? Do you remember that? <laughs> yes, yes, it's, it's deeply embedded. Um, first of all, thank you very much for asking me to join you today. It's a pleasure to talk about the partnership, which was very special and uh, continues to be a very important part of Chess Challenge in D.C. Um, the goals of our partnership were to really examine, review, update, tighten, or refine every major organizational function of Chess Challenge in DC. Uh, particularly, though, our financial procedures and reports, legal documents, the creation of an HR manual, new board member agreements and individual plans, board goals, and a new fundraising plan that spanned two fiscal years. With Anjali, I think we were able to bring most systems uh, to a new level of sophistication, and I, that was exactly what I was looking for in the partnership. Okay. Um, and 
talk, can you talk a little bit about how you worked with, with Anjali? Um, you know, when you met when you met every week, like what did you do and what was that relationship like? Um, and those meetings were very special, um, and Anjali and I have remained friends. Um, it, the relationship had many facets. Uh, first of all, there was certainly um, between us a tremendous level of um, credibility and um, I, I think a lot of respect. And um, Anjali became my friend, my confidant and sounding board, my mentor, and truly when necessary she held my feet to the fire. Um, we met, uh, each session really began with a recap of how my time had been spent since our last meeting. So it was actually a time for me to really use a very safe space to uh, talk about things that, yeah, either crises or um, successes or frustrations that I might have uh, dealing with the organization as an ED. These were certainly things that were inappropriate for me to discuss with board members or with my staff. So I did have someone whom I trusted greatly to talk to, and um, that became a very precious time. That's a very that's a big challenge for EDU to have a space, right? For that. Yes, definitely, have, like, definitely, because we're always straddling. I think a, a very delicate line, um, and together, Anjali and I really uh, established our priorities and the timelines for accomplishing certain things. And um, I can say that she won the respect and confidence of my board of directors, um, often taking a stance or being directive in a way that would be injudicious for me. Um, and due to her tremendous skill set and the myriad resources that, finance, that Fair Chance has, um, Chess Challenge definitely profited. Um, can you talk a little bit about some of those ways in which you profited? Like, what what happened? You know, what happened in the organization? I mean, what you know, what happened immediately, and then now, where are you now? Questions are a little bit different from yeah. what I had been sent. Sure. So, <laughs> let me uh, let me try to um, to address that. Um, I think that we went through. Um, an interesting time during our partnership, which I should say, I'm, I'm pleased to say, spanned two years because we did join Fair Chance for a second year partnership. Um, and so these were very important growth years for, um, for Chess Challenge. <clears throat> we were relatively young and, as a matter of fact, um, had been approached by Fair Chance in 2010 uh, about a partnership. and I wanted to share that at that point in time, I actually declined because I felt that um, from everything I had learned from colleagues in the field, that this was a very significant undertaking. And I wanted both Chess Challenge and myself to be in the right place to take advantage of the partnership. So I did decline that year, and we reapplied the following year when I felt we were in a more solid place and had a better footing. Um, we began the partnership, I think, by looking at the eight areas of, uh, of potential development. Um, we decided that um, there were some definite needs. Um, we worked together to strengthen our financial management. Um, and our various processes there. We worked on board development together. Uh, Anjali actually led at least two retreats uh, for uh, Chess Challenge, and that was a, an extremely important um, process for us, and it was her guidance uh, really proved to be so beneficial. Um, we looked at our fundraising. Uh, we had a, a dip in our fundraising, to put, <laughs> to put it gently, um, and Anjali became, I think we became joined at the hip at that point, um, and she was such a tremendous support for me um, during that time in, as we tried to figure out how to address the issues that we were facing as an organization. Um, I think that many of the things that we instituted are still in play. Um, we definitely handle our board orientation, our recruitment and orientation differently. Um, 
the financial management pieces are in place, our HR manual is in place, we revised our board uh, bylaws, uh, the organization's bylaws, and um, these were all incredibly important changes to our infrastructure that have, have really, it's, it's all about capacity building, and that's exactly what the partnership did for Chess Challenge. So what, what, um, what can you do now that you couldn't do before, and what can Chess Challenge do that you couldn't do before? I think that I'm certainly a stronger executive director for having been through the program. Um, it really, um, I'm mindful now of a better work-life balance, <laughs> not that I'm always able to, to, to live that, but um, I think that the, the partnership absolutely affected and benefited the children whom we serve because it made us a better organization. Um, I think I have a clearer sense of my role as an executive director. Um, and uh, that has hopefully uh, really channeled itself in how I handle both my relationship with my staff and with my board. Um, there's no question that having certain processes in place has made it easier. We don't have to recreate that wheel. They're in place and we can go forward um, assuming that they're going to work for us year after year. And uh, that has been the case. Um, I think that our fundraising became more streamlined um, and um, we learned to tell our story in a more compelling way uh, as a result of the, of the relationship too. Um, I think that, that about covers it. Can you tell us a little bit about how, you know, you said you, you needed to wait a year to, to make sure that the organization was ready and that you were ready, that you had the space because you knew it was a demanding commitment. Um, how did you manage to find the time for this effort in addition to everything else that you do as an ED? Um, I think that I gave myself permission uh, really to carve out the space and time. Um, I knew that while it really was significant, the, the, it's, it's truly a situation where what you put in is what you get back from it. And knowing that, I made the commitment and I think my board accepted um, and supported my decision to go through the process because they felt there was a tremendous amount of credibility. Um, and, and obviously I had um, really gone out to my colleagues in the field and said, you've done this, tell me about what the relationship is like, what is the process like. I really wanted to know what I was getting into. Once I fully understood what I was getting into, um, I made the commitment. This was simply a priority. And I think that, that that's required. And do you remember, this is you know, maybe too far back, but do you remember what it was that your colleagues in the field told you that persuaded you that you wanted to do this? Um, <laughs> you could do it. <laughs> I, can, I can think of one in particular. <laughs> um, and who absolutely said it was, it was a valuable experience. And yes, it was at times onerous, I will be honest, um, where, you know, it was just like, oh my gosh, I have, you know, 16 other priorities on my plate right now, but this has got to be one of them, if not the top because whatever I was going to glean from the relationship, and I had been told it would be significant, um, was going to depend on how much I participated in the partnership. Yeah. Yeah. So we, yeah, we, we, one of the things that we talk about is that the partnership is both, it's transformational and rewarding, and it's also demanding. You have to be ready to make that commitment. Yes, absolutely. Um, so in addition to the direct impact that you, you experienced working with Anjali, um, were there other benefits that you and your organization derived from being part of this network? Um, unequivocally, yes. Um, I can tell you that being a part of Fair Chance and being an alum is really like being an alum of a college. There is, um, there is a network there. I turn to our e-forum uh, probably twice a month 
to ask a question, um, does someone have a contact that I might use? Does someone have someone to recommend? How are you handling some, a particular issue? Um, I think that it's a very, very beneficial, um, that network is extremely beneficial. I think, too, that I realized that the Fair Chance Partnership was something that I would indeed be able to leverage um, in many ways, um, both in fundraising. I think it is very much akin to, um, maybe I shouldn't plug another organization, but being part of the catalog for philanthropy. There is kind of a, a good housekeeping seal of approval that, uh, that you automatically achieve when you have participated in this relationship. And you can say to a funder, I've been through fair chance. We have taken the organization through the partnership. We've examined things. We're far better as a result of it. Um, and I think it lends a tremendous amount of credibility. That's great. Thank you. So Susie, um, is there anything that I haven't asked about that you'd want people to know about the partnership and your experience? Or Anjali? <laughs> I really am thinking about that. Um, <clears throat> I can't recommend it enough. Um, I think that, um, to sum up what I've said, because I think I've pretty much touched on everything, is that you need to be ready for it. You need to make the commitment. Your board needs to support you. Um, and that is critically important. Um, and then give yourself over to the process and participate. That's great advice. That's wonderful. Great advice. Now, Anjali, is there anything that you, else that you'd add that folks should think about as they're applying or they're considering the partnership about? Sure. Um, I would just add in following up sort of on what Susie was saying that, um, you know, part of the application process, we, we do ask that your board chair fill in part of the application and that, um, and, and that through the interview that the board is involved. Um, and getting that buy-in early, I think, is important. But also throughout the year, there are opportunities for us to really um, bring the board closer in. So as Susie mentioned, you know, after we had finished, finalized our work plan, I went to the board meeting and presented the work plan to the board. And you know, they had an opportunity to weigh in and really ask because you know, it is a commitment that the executive director is making, but the board has to recognize and give the executive director the time to really do this work. Um, and one of the things, you know, to sort of, if you're sitting there as an executive director, thinking, well, this is too much work. Um, most of the work that we do, if you look at our eight areas and the things that are in there, um, most of them are things that an executive director is responsible for anyway. Um, and so we are enhancing and supplementing and helping you do the things that you have to do. Um, and it, sometimes it's just a question of timing, right? So as Susie mentioned, she had 16 things that were on her plate one day, and, and the Fair Chance homework was part of that. Um, and so hopefully it's not always like that, that oftentimes what we're working on is stuff that you would be working on anyway, like the budget, like performance evaluations, things like that. Uh, I, I want to really join Anjali uh, in that regard. I think that, you know, as I sit here and I look back, and granted it's, it's been uh, a year and a half or more since we've really seriously worked together, um, that's absolutely true. I think that much of the work that, or some of the work that I had to accomplish, I did with Anjali, and she honed the processes to the point where it made that job easier for me, even though it was, you know, it, it was looking at it from a new angle or approaching it from a new spreadsheet or whatever it might be. I learned new skills that ultimately helped me accomplish my work better and faster. That's great. So yeah, I would say as I reflect on what I heard you say, it reminds me of my own experience as an executive director. Um, I remember the opportunities that I had to work with a consultant where I could get up to 30,000 feet, get my finger out of the dike for a few minutes and just start to think about, okay, what am I really doing here? Am I really yes. trying to <laughs> and was able to then start to shift. Um, and, I, and I just wanted to mention a couple of things that as I've been talking to partners that I've heard, last year we had an interview with one of our um, executive directors who talked about, who also worked with Anjali, and she talked about how when she was thinking about doing the partnership, she had a lot of anxiety about how she was going to create the space for this. 
but she realized she'd have to be very intentional, and she carved out her space, and it became a sacrosanct space. And everybody in the organization knew, Anjali's coming. This is, this is her time. We're going to respect that. And what she figured out was, over the course of the year, that this time was so valuable that she actually observes that space still today. It's part of everybody in the organization knows this is sort of Anjali time is now her time. <laughs> so that's an institution for her to be a more reflective, more strategic leader, um, which is pretty profound. Uh, another thing that I heard, um, uh, and last week we had an open house and we had an executive director um, join us to talk about um, what happened in her organization. She talked about you know having come into the partnership sort of almost in crisis. Her organization had a budget of uh, about $100,000. But they weren't sure that they were really, it became clear shortly into the partnership that they, they weren't really that stable. Um, and because of the work that they've done in the partnership, her organization has a budget of $700,000 now in growing. And they have a building, a dedicated building, a new space for their work. Um, and she just sees just, you know, the possibilities for her organization opening up everywhere. So I think, you know, those are the kinds of things that the partnership makes possible. And it's important for folks to realize that you're like, what is this, no pain, no gain? But it is, it's an investment in your future as a leader and the organization's future. Um, and that pays off in big ways. I totally agree. <laughs> Sitting here nodding currently. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. So, with, uh, so having heard all of that, what I'd like to do now is just open the floor to questions from our audience and see if you have questions for either Anjali or Susie. Um, you can enter them um, by through the chat if you are not on the microphone. And then, follow me. How, how do they get call in if they're on the microphone? What do they do? So type in that you just type in um, audio if you have a question, and, un, and we will unmute you so you can ask your question. We'll just give it a few more minutes to see if anybody else has questions. Again, if you want us to unmute you, you want to ask your question through the audio, just type audio and we'll unmute you. And um, if, you have a, if you don't have audio and you're just listening in, you can type through the chat what your question is and we will do our best to answer it. So, um, so we have a question from one of the members in the audience. Um, she asked us, what would you say was the, was the biggest challenge during the first year of your partnership? It's a very good question. Um, everything seemed like a priority. <coughs> so I think the, probably the, the biggest challenge for me and for Anjali and me together was to really set what the priorities were uh, through our work plan, uh, to really zero in on what what can we accomplish, what needs to be accomplished first, uh, and make that decision together. Um, it's, I'm having difficulty remembering anything specific, but I think that that really was it. It was, it was staying on track once we established what the priorities were. Um, and honestly, keeping me on track is probably really the fairer way to say it. And what, what do you think made that possible, or that she was able to do that? Was it just having the accountability it was, it was certainly accountability. It was definitely because, as I mentioned earlier, um, I think that um, Anjali had such credibility with me. I just believed in her um, her advice. I trusted her uh, so much that if she said to me, no, no, you're, you're veering off, as I said earlier, she held my feet to the fire on occasion, um, that if I was veering off because I was distracted by another situation, um, it was that it was, I allowed her and was comfortable with her redirecting me. Um, any other questions? We have about five minutes left, so we would love to have any questions and anything. There's no right or wrong questions. Anything at all that you want to ask Anjali or Susie. And again, 
you can type them into the chat box, or if you're on audio, you can also just type in audio and we'll unmute you. You can ask it in person. Um, so also just uh, answering that question from earlier around what was the biggest challenge during the first year of the partnership um, from a different perspective rather than like the process of the partnership but in terms of what the organization was facing um, at that time I think the board was challenging in the sense that there was some great strong leadership um, but there was also some folks that had been on the board for a while that weren't so engaged and um, and it was kind of challenging to I think both the the board chair and Susie I'm now putting words in your mouth but I, if I'm recalling this correctly you know there was a, a great level of frustration in terms of how do we engage and energize this board and they were trying everything that they could think of um, and so that was one of the challenges that we had to really think about being creative in, you know, it, the people were, were there, they loved the organization, and yet there just wasn't a lot of follow through, there wasn't a lot of communication, uh, you know, and not for lack of trying, right? And so, so it really became how do we, how do, how does the organization and the, and the board specifically hold themselves accountable? Um, and 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 really, what were the commitments that they were making to each other, and was there clarity around some of that? And so we we tried to approach that in in a bunch of different ways to to see what would stick. But in the end, you triumphed. <laughs> <laughs> we have a much stronger board now, indeed. So Anjali, I don't want to put you on the spot, but if you think about your partners collectively, you know, are there common challenges that sort of come up in the first year typically, or that you you know, is there something consistent that can kind of come up or, you know, that organization should prepare for? In, in terms of that comes up, up around the partnership year yeah. as opposed to, like, something in the eight areas? Well, as, as I would, yeah, like, I guess both. You know, okay. if you're working with them, like, this is, if you kind of see a common thing, maybe it's around expectations and a disconnect between expectations and what actually happens or, or an opportunity that they don't see. Sure. I mean, I, I think that um, in terms of the process, I, I think that Fair Chance as an organization has actually gotten clearer in terms of communicating what the benefits are and what the expectations are. And, um, you know, I've, I've, as Susie mentioned, you know, she, she did her due diligence in reaching out to past partners and finding out what their experience was like. Um, and I've heard from other folks that have done the same. Um, which I think has prompted us to do these webinars, right, so that you don't necessarily need to go find and talk to other partners. We're bringing partners to you so that you can um, hear from them firsthand. You're still encouraged to go talk to any partners you might know, but um, that's just, uh, something that we never used to do this, right? And so um, I think we've learned how to make this partnership stronger and better and give the executive directors what they need. Um, so. So some of that's been been addressed, but that used to, I think, be an issue in the past. Um, and so partners used to sort of talk about what they didn't see, which we've talked about today, is um, just how transformative the process is on the executive director in terms of getting people out of the weeds, right? Like, you know, every executive director, I think, talks about, you know, they're supposed to be thinking strategically and that maybe only happens when you're doing strategic planning, but how do you, amongst everything else that you have to do as an executive director, raise yourself up so that you can think strategically? And, you know, hopefully some of the work that we do in the year is, is putting in those places where you can be more thoughtful and use your data and, um, you know, and, and really just um, do the things that, you love doing as an executive director, right? I mean, um, and it's different, I think, for, you know, working with some organizations where they're founders and, you know, they might be visionaries but have no real management experience versus, you know, some folks who come at this who've got, you know, they came to being an executive director after getting a nonprofit 
degree, and you know, so they they know what they're doing in that sense. But um, but maybe you want some space to to think about the vision more and build a board that's going to help them in different ways. And um, so there's always space. Thank you. That was really that's wonderful. And Susie's vigorously nodding. And I would ask her for a follow-up comment. We're actually about to wrap up. So um, I just want to put a couple of reminders out here. So the application deadline is up next Friday. Um, if the application is online, you can access it through our website, um, and um, it will be due by 11:59 p.m. next Friday night. If you haven't started preparing already and are going to apply, I encourage you to start immediately. It's a pretty lengthy process. We ask for a lot of information. It helps us really understand who you are and figure out how we can be of best service to you. Um, the application link is below as well. You can just copy that or you can just get it from the website, as I said. And there's more information on the website. And we also are looking at posting. We did do a webinar last week where we talked about what were the core requirements of the partnership, some of which we got to. And also we talked about what it would mean, to, what you needed to do to make sure you submitted a strong application. So if you have any questions, you can also call um, Samto Ueze, who is um, the program associate for this um, outreach process, and or you can call me. Um, we'd be happy to answer any questions that you have, um, or you can shoot us an email at the addresses here. So, without with further out further ado, I'm going to wrap up and thank you all for attending. I hope you'll submit applications. We're excited to read them and look forward to hopefully seeing them in our box next week. Thank you.